of these stories will you be talking about tomorrow? Monster, the top unpaid foreign policy advisor to Barack Obama, apologizes to Hillary Clinton after she described her as, quote, a monster, and then said, quote, that is off the record. Pulitzer Prize winner Samantha Power quits the Obama campaign. The Clinton camp holds two news conference calls about it. And she insists there's no comparison between the monster remark and her camp comparing Obama to Lewinsky prosecutor Kenneth Starr. And that there's nothing wrong with comparing Obama to Lewinsky prosecutor Kenneth Starr. One is an ad hominem attack and one is a historical reference. Hillary a monster. Historical reference. Indeed. Samantha Power, Clinton and genocide. The Barack Obama campaign is about to pay a very high price for the inopportune words of one of its most distinguished foreign policy advisors. The dazzlingly brilliant journalist, Pulitzer Prize winning author, and Harvard professor, Samantha Power, has been forced to resign from the campaign after she recklessly told a reporter that Hillary Clinton is a monster. In the pungently hypocritical game of American politics, this is just something outside the rules. Whether it's true or not, matters little. Nor does it matter that the object of power's derision has just finished spending millions on TV ads implying that Obama would be responsible for the countless deaths of millions of American children sleeping at 3 a.m. Tut, tut. Nothing monstrous about that. Power was rightfully awarded the Pulitzer for her finally written and downright horrifying book, A Problem from Hell, which, in macabre detail, describes the calculated indifference of the Clinton administration when 800,000 Rwandans were being systematically butchered. The red phone rang and rang and rang again. I don't know where Hillary was then. But her husband and his entire experienced foreign policy team, from the brass in the Pentagon to the congenitally feckless Secretary of State Warren Christopher, just let it ring. And as more than one researcher has amply documented the case, the bloody paralysis of the Clinton administration in the face of the Rwandan genocide owed not at all to a lack of information, but rather to a lack of will. A reviewer of Power's book for the New York Times perhaps summed it up best, saying that the picture of Clinton that emerges from this reading is that of an amoral narcissist. Eventually, ten times that many would die. And our response. A handful of years later, at a photo op stopover in Kigali Airport, Bill Clinton bit his lip and said he was sorry. Therein resides the richest and saddest irony of all. Samantha Power has actually lived the sort of life that Hillary Clinton's campaign staff has, for public consumption, invented for its candidate. Though not quite 40 years old, Power has spent no time on any Walmart boards but has rather dedicated her entire adult life rather tirelessly to championing humanitarian causes. She has spoken up when others were silent. She took great personal risks during the bulk and was to witness and record and denounce the carnage. She reported that Bill Clinton intervened against the Serbs only when he felt he was losing personal credibility as a result of his inaction. I'm getting creamed, Power quoted the then president saying as he fretted over global consternation over his own hesitation to act. We gave Power the Pulitzer for exposing the well, monstrous indifference of the Clinton administration as it stared unblinkingly and immobile into the face of massive horror. But we'd give her a kick in the backside and throw her out the door when she has the temerity to publicly restate all that in one impolite word. Monstrous, indeed. Clinton, Genocide and a Campaign Gaffe. By Mark Cooper. March 7, 2008. hundred years later, the Negro still is not free. One hundred years later, the, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. My guess is that what they're going to do is they are going to play the race card, but they're going to do it in a very, that. very subtle way. They say to themselves, okay, I have a choice between 
a truly inspirational speaker who has not done the kind of spade work. Give me a break. This whole thing is the biggest fairy tale I've ever seen. I want African Americans to feel that when I'm president, it's another Clinton presidency. Um, Bill Clinton was sending back Haitian refugees who were fleeing a regime that was armed by the United States. He was welcoming Cubans to Florida because he needed the Florida electoral vote. But he was violating international law, sending Haitians back without examining to discover, to, to discern whether they were legitimate political refugees or not, meaning they were fleeing with a well-founded fear for their lives. And he knew many of them were being killed by FRAP and those killers in Haiti that had been armed by the United States. I want African Americans to feel that when I'm president, it's another Clinton presidency. But he did that. I went on a 28-day 20 20 hunger strike to cause him to change, but he didn't change before, because he had found uh, Christ. He changed because um, a public began to learn what he had been doing. These matters are larger than race. Uh, we're talking about being sensitive to the interest of, uh, of humankind. And so I think we want a president who has um, a vigorous intellectual curiosity and an overarching decency and humanity. The first black president, Clinton legacy of lynching update. Buy me a tea. It may be true that the law cannot make a man love me, but it can keep him from lynching me, and I think that's pretty important. Ironically, the logic of this pronouncement by Martin Luther King would, in short order, be refuted by the reality of his own lynching. King's hope was misplaced and his reasoning was circular. The resultant rule of law relied on by King presumed an adherence to the rule of law in the first instance. Adherence to the rule of law is not something normally associated with the Clintons. Moreover, racial and ethnic disrespect, intimidation, exploitation and hate have always been a fundamental Clinton tactic and the reflexive use of the N-word and other racial and ethnic slurs an essential element in the Clinton lexicon. When the first black president and his wife ran Arkansas, the NAACP sued them for intimidating black voters at the polls. Conversely, the Clinton's refinement of the DNC drag and drop is, arguably, one of the more insidious and repugnant applications of their special brand of race-hate politics. Calculating a black man's worth to be five-thirds of a vote is no less racist, and arguably more so, than calculating his worth to be three-fifths of a white man, the latter is demeaning, but the former is dehumanizing. But it is even worse. Listen to Randall Robinson in this video, read below about Rwanda. Only one conclusion is possible, a Clinton legacy of lynching. Bill Clinton felt their pain retrospectively. In 1998, on his grand apology tour of Africa, a whirlwind tour of whirlwind apologies for slavery, the Cold War, you name it. He touched down in Kigali and apologized for the Rwandan genocide, 
biting his lip, as is his wont. During the bloodbath, Clinton administration officials were specifically instructed not to use the word genocide, lest it provoke public pressure to do something. Documents made public last week confirmed that U.S. officials knew within the first few days that a final solution to eliminate all two seas was underway. Stein on America.